Welcome to the Salience Podcast, where we identify what stands out from all the noise. On the Salience Podcast today, we continue our explorations of feedback and feed forward as a means of learning. When Jen and I were discussing this season of interviews and positioning for our next season on the theme of sense making, we realised that we have a bias towards the military and police. On reflection, this probably reflects some of the domains where feedback and feed forward is sometimes done really well. Not always. Sometimes in the, the military and police fail to learn in spectacular fashion. Of course, one of the points of the Salience podcast is to focus on what stands out from the crowd. And today's guest has been an inspiration to me for a long time. Today, I am joined by Joe Biley. Joe has a long career in the US Army. He's an active battalion commander. He's a non-resident fellow of the Modern War Institute at West Point and has provided strategic advice on warfare. Joe is also founder of From the Green Notebook, which is where I came across Joe. The background to the Green Notebook idea came from Joe's desire to create a place where leaders could share their experiences and help each other along the journey. He started looking at the place where he captured his own lessons and ideas for the future, his green notebook. And I'm going to talk to, to Joe more about that, that concept in a little while. And, and that's what I find inspirational, the discipline to keep a learning journal. Each month, Joe shares uh, his reading journey with other leaders. Uh, he, he talks about books uh, that have inspired him. And he interviews prominent leaders, especially military commanders, uh, for his podcast. And my inspiration interview, uh, Joe, for this season was to tease out his learnings from all those great leaders he's interviewed and the very concept of using a notebook to reflect on feedback and project into the future, into future action, uh, is just such a simple and effective way of feed forward feedback uh, and, and making that practical. So uh, welcome, Joe. Thank you, uh, Dr. Snape, for having me. Before we start exploring, uh, you know, what you've learned from some of the terrific leaders you've interviewed, uh, can, you, can you please outline for, for our listeners, you know, what is a green notebook and what, what does a green notebook mean to you? Okay, yeah. So the, a green notebook uh, in the U.S. military, uh, we, are, we have government-issued notebooks that, that we don't have to go out and spend our own money on. We can go to our local supply rooms and get them. And uh they're, uh, they're like this five by five by uh, seven notebook it says Federal Supply Service on the front. And uh, and, you know, it's it's very typical for military leaders uh, throughout their entire career to mass an entire collection of them. And then you, and it's they're uh, they're used for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, you go to your meetings, you take notes in them, um, you know, you get ideas, your to do list, you write those in them. Um, you, we do something called the after action review, which is, you know, something that you cover in your book. And we write the lessons that we got from that. So it's there, it's a multi utility. It's a Swiss army knife for thought, the green notebook. And so, um, when I was thinking of a name for the website, I wanted to do something that was, was common to everybody. And so, uh, they knew that, you know, if they were going to the green from the green notebook, you know, for the military audience, that's exactly what, what they were doing. And there was going to be getting lessons learned from myself and other people. But it, it didn't it didn't start out that way, but that's what it's evolved into now. Yeah, <clears throat> I love that, you know, Swiss Army knife for thought. What a great metaphor. I've never said that before. It just <laughs> I started. Yeah, I was, I, uh, that was the first time that's ever popped in my head. So I need to write that down as soon as we get off the, this this episode. I, I I think that's so true. You know, capturing lessons learned, meeting notes, after action reviews, of course, which I, I think is so key. I, I just got one really quick reflection, and I'll, I'll share this with readers. I often coach executives who are trying to manage hostile environments. Uh, there could be conflict, it could be political, all sorts of things. And I look at what they're doing and where they're writing, and, and most of the time they're writing on really poor quality notebooks, uh, often spiral bound, and it's a temporary artifact. And I say, I've got a recommendation. Can I suggest that you get a hardbound notebook and you start taking 
notes with time, day, who's present, and record the following. In years to come, it could be years, it could be days, it could be months, you'll find that there are times when you need to go back to that. And if you can record the critical elements and you learn to track what's most important, what's most salient, it will, it will protect you and give you, uh, give you an edge. And, uh, and it does over and over. Yeah, there's. Uh, I, I gotta share something with you. I pulled this out for this episode, but I think it, it captures like the process of reflecting in a notebook. It's called Autobiography in Five Short Chapters. I don't know who wrote it. It's uh, by an anonymous author. But uh, Chapter One: I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I am lost. I am helpless. It isn't my fault. It takes forever to find a way out. Chapter Two: I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I am in the same place, but it isn't my fault. And it still takes a long time to get out. Chapter three, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it is there. I still fall in. It's a habit, but my eyes are open. I know where I am. It is my fault. I get out immediately. Chapter four, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Chapter five, I walk down another street, the end. And uh, <laughs> I think a lot of us get stuck in the first two chapters, you know, whatever we're dealing with in our lives uh, of the issues we run into. But when you're doing what you're talking about, you know, journaling, writing it down, you start to see over time that a lot of the problems we create for ourselves, the holes that we keep falling into of our, our own making. And then we start to see the habits. And then once we gain awareness, I believe that then we can, we can do action, some action and, and actually start feeding forward. I'm going to, I'm going to use that. That's fantastic. Did you learn the importance of this in your early days in the army uh, or was this something that you did beforehand? Tell us about, tell us about what happened before, long before the green notebook. Yeah. So, um, when I, I'd say like my first, my first couple of combat deployments, I was not doing any of this that, that we're talking about now. And I was, I was messing up a lot. I was, uh, I was still learning. Um, I would spend my times playing video games, going out drinking, doing everything but the stuff I'm doing right now. And, um, I would say sometime after, uh, my my company command, I was commanding a, a 250 person organization at that time. Um, I started reading for growth and I would come across these nuggets on blogs and in books. And I was like, this is, this is solid gold. I got to write it down. And like the stuff I'm writing down, the notebook I'm looking at right now is from 2012. Um, so when you're talking about something that's going to last that you can go back to, um, you know, I'm able to hold this in my hand. And so I wrote down the things that I thought was important. And then um, I I met, uh, I started working for a guy named uh, Major General H.R. McMaster. And then in the U.S. military, he's he's known as, as one of our, our greatest thinkers. And uh, he would, uh, I remember like every Monday he would come in and he would ask me if I had read certain books. And I, I said, no. And he was like, you got to read this. Let me tell you why. He would get so excited. And so I, I started filling up my Amazon shopping cart every single day. And, you know, every single week I would come home and from these meetings and fill it up and, and buy books. And I was, there was just so much information that I was taking in. I was like, I don't know. I was like worried that I was going to lose it. And so I, I, I continued to write things down in, uh, in notebooks and, uh, and then over time, it started out as like a commonplace notebook, you know, interesting thoughts, ideas, you know, passages, lines, quotes. Uh, and then eventually, I, I would say a couple of years ago, I started journaling because I realized, you know, I was having a lot of like self-sabotaging behaviors. And uh, I started journaling in, uh, in 2021. And I've been doing it every day since. And uh, going back to that, you know, five chapter autobiography I just told you about, all of a sudden I could start seeing the holes and, and in some instances even walk down a different street. 
so this was probably a, a decade plus uh, evolution that, that we just talked about in the last two minutes. Yeah, I think, isn't that interesting that you've identified Major General McMaster as a catalyst in there, an inspiration, somebody who whose energy and, and attention really, really brought you into the concept of reading? Yeah, I, I remember he would give these talks and he would say the, just the most profound things. And then we'd go back to his office and he'd say, hey, have you read this? And I'm like, I haven't. And then I would read the book. And then I would see the exact same thing he just said <laughs> in this book. And I realized that he was pulling and synthesizing ideas across, you know, mul multiple books. And uh, I was like, I, I want to do that. Um, and in my, you know, young, uh, early 30 hubris, I was like, I will catch up to this guy. And so uh, I went from the time reading, you know, a handful, maybe five books a year to that's when I started reading about four to five books a month. Um, and I've been doing that ever since. So I think like I looked at it the other day, I think I'm up to like 460 something books since I, I started this habit in, uh, in 2012. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, I, and you say you've got that early 30 something hubris. Uh, I, I'll, I'll challenge that uh, and say, I think what you've described is, is a realization that you know, you, you, you described your early commands, you were, you were messing things up, you were drinking, playing video games, uh, and, you, and you've started to switch and you realized that you needed this aid to help you learn this, this concept of a notebook. Uh, I think if you really had hubris, you probably wouldn't read and you'd assume that you could sort this stuff out yourself when, in fact, you, you're drawing on the teachings of, you know, at least 460 authors in this case in the last 10 years. Uh, so, so, so I challenge the concept of hubris there, but you know, that maybe the, the competitive, uh, young fella going, wow, I want to, I want to be like this, this ability to draw on and synthesize. And, and what's interesting too, because you, as we were talking before you hit the record button about my, my fascination with, with polar exploration, um, is uh, I read a book called The Last Place on Earth, and uh, it was about the 1911 uh, race to the South Pole between Sir Robert Falcon Scott and Roald, um, Roald Amundsen. And, uh, you know, the, the way the author portrayed the, the two figures was uh, Scott was just basically relying on his past experience, and, uh, and that was it. And Amundsen would take every single book uh, that somebody wrote like Nansen or Perry and study them, read them. And then if he had the chance to meet one of those individuals, he'd ask a thousand questions. And so he was able to combine that with his own experience of polar exploration. And you see at the very end, one team, everybody comes home alive. The other team, you know, they, they piece together their journey by their removing the journals from their frozen bodies and uh and that really that really stuck with me you know through, throughout the rest of my military career yeah you've uh, i mean i i spent 25 years in polar exploration and and interestingly i had not made that connection to one of the best examples of feedback and feed forward uh so th thanks for drawing my attention to that. And I, and I think what a great example of the benefit of feed forward. You've both got experience. One person, though, is diligently gathering as much information from disparate sources and building that into their feed forward process and their planning and their, their attitude to, to tackling uh, what is an incredibly uncertain uh, way forward, an uncertain future. Yeah. And I think too, um, you know, go, going back to connecting it all, right? Like I think one is reading and then the other one is writing um, and writing it down in a notebook. Um, I, I, uh, I, I read Walter Isaacson's biography of Da Vinci and, uh, you know, Leonardo would, because paper was so expensive, he would write everything in his notebooks 
he would sketch, um, you know, like, so if, when you look at his notebooks, you see the early, um, you know, drawings of, of some of his most famous painting sketches, but like next to a grocery list or, uh, or observations of people sitting at a, at a cafe, or, uh, he would write down passages from books. Um, and so he was able to combine all these disciplines together and and make amazing art from it and so um i was like i i want to do that too and uh and so in my notebooks it's everything is in there from to-do lists to to random thoughts to this you know the passages and and lines i've learned from books and it's been really cool um i know you keep a notebook as well but to take yeah different things from different areas like we were just talking about polar exploration and applying it to the military or talking about the Renaissance and then applying it to my, to my current life. So I think that's been a, a really cool practice to do alongside of reading. Yeah. Yeah. Just before we press record on this, you and I were talking about some, some life changing sort of moments. And I, I reflected that at around about 2010, uh, I was being taught by John Grinder uh, about patterns and, and human behavior. And I suddenly started thinking radically differently. Uh, I stopped tracking the content, the domain, if you like, polar, military, uh, art, and da Vinci are examples of, of domains. Uh, and I started tracking processes that could go across domain, uh, which is a little bit like what you're talking about when you're journaling, you can identify patterns. You know, you, you talk about the five chapters, the autobiography. It's about identifying patterns of behavior, uh, and they can be in metaphor, they can be in, in, in literal. They can be in one aspect of your life, and you go, wow, this pattern propagates in different aspects of my life. You know, it could be uh, patterns of inattention. It could be patterns of where you where you lack discipline, and you go, you know, when I lack discipline here, look what happens, and this is the... These are aspects of my life uh, where where this happens. Yeah, I um. So it, it's interesting. So as I I journal uh, every day, and in my journal I track. Uh, I wear I wear a whoop, um, and so what what that does is it give, tells me how long I slept for every single day uh, when I woke up, and it gives me a percentage based off uh, my strain, my recovery, and so. Um, you know, I can, it helps me to be more deliberate about going to bed early, um, about drinking less, uh, so it doesn't affect my sleep. Um, but I can start seeing when, uh, as I'm tracking it every single day, when it starts going from green to yellow and stays in yellow and then potentially dips down to red, I know that like I am, you know, I'm, I'm about to hit a cliff of bad decisions, um, and, but, but like, I can track that now before, you know, I would be like, Oh, where did this come from? Now I know, you know, where it's come from because I I'm sitting there watching it unfold on a piece of paper or, um, it is well, like there, there's certain, um, situations I've found myself in that, you know, I didn't react the way I wanted to. And so even just writing it down, you can kind of start uh, dissecting that and, you know, start looking at, uh, at, at the root causes, you know, like, um, I, I think it's what you talk about in the, the feedback feed forward chapter of the evidence versus inference. Um, you know, you're, you're actually able to do that when you write it down. Um, I think that's really hard to do without, uh, actually looking at words and trying to do it in, in your mind, at least unless, unless you're, you, you've trained yourself at it. Yeah, I've had some similar experiences where I've used I've used notes to keep a track of what I'm going to call state. Uh, in this case, you know, it could be alcohol, it could be sleep, it could be heart rate variability, and and when you start tr using some of these instruments to track, you can learn to calibrate. You can learn to detect in your own body, and um, what I'd be really interested for you perhaps in a few months is uh, let's reconnect. And uh, I wonder if you can learn to to predict exactly what the monitoring is going to give you 
to the point where you no longer need it. You go, you know what? I've got such a fine tune. I know that I'm 6.5 today. Yeah. It, it's interesting. So I read, uh, I read, um, I think it's is it Matthew Welker. It's why we sleep it is the book. And before that I was staying, like I was, I was like living in the yellow, um, every single day for weeks at a time. And I would literally crash on a Saturday because of just the, you know, 60, 70 hour work weeks, the stress of the job, the stress of being a leader. And I read that book and then all of a sudden I started paying attention to it a lot more and actually like adjusting my own behaviors to where I could go weeks getting all green sleep. Like I was, I was literally like calibrating myself uh, for, for optimal performance. But again, something that I wasn't like, I had to have awareness first, which was the why we sleep book. And then I could actually take some action after that. So I, again, reading, writing, reflection, that's what we say all the time at uh, from the green notebook. And I, I, I truly believe that like, those are the keys uh, to, to lead. And this sounds a little cheesy, but to leading with the best version of yourself. Um, I, I think if you're not doing those things, uh, you're constantly falling in, in random holes in the, in the sidewalk, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think, I think within there for me, there's this underlying focus on, on what I'm going to call calibration calibration of how you're going you know you, you went from weeks and weeks of yellow uh 60 70 hour work weeks to suddenly you're in the green and I, I think there's a learning there where we can use the the writing the journaling and the the analysis to help us and then we we can probably switch we can probably let that one go if we if we tune in enough uh, i remember quite a long time ago maybe almost 20 years ago i i bought a breathalyzer and uh i i, I I really never wanted to drink drive, so I was pretty careful about that. And I thought, you know, I want to I want to check myself before I get in this car. And in in Australia, we've got a, a an alcohol tolerance of zero point zero five, which is reasonably low. And we'd go out. I might go to a restaurant. I'd go to a bar. I'd have a drink, uh, and I I I breathalyze myself before I'd get in the car. And I wanted to be well below that. In, in no way did I ever want to be the wrong side of the law. And, and after about two months of doing this, every time I went out, I realized that I could predict to within a, a, th that decimal place exactly where I was. There was no need for me to um, breathalyze myself anymore. I know that I can go out, uh, I can go to a restaurant, and I can have one gl large glass of wine. And that's it for my metabolism. That's, my, that's, my, that's me done. Uh, if I go out for two hours and I have a meal or, or a bit longer, I can maybe have a second. Uh, but I'm, I'm looking a little bit marginal there. Uh, I'm, I just stopped bothering calibrating this thing and lugging it around. There was no point. I knew exactly in my body. I could feel it in my body. I knew what I drank. And, and I think that's applied for, for so much of what we can learn, you know? I, I agree. And I, I, may, I may save a couple of dollars every month, um, you know, in, in the next year or so because you, you're right. I, I, I am able to, like, wake up in the morning and I can generally tell where I'm sitting at uh, because I've been tracking this for literally like two years now. Um, and so I, I think that's, that's a very valid point. Well, you know, I, I think what that does then is it, it allows us to then take our attention to the next evolution of ourselves. You know, maybe the next thing's heart rate variability. You know, I've got, I've got a really good buddy. He's been tracking that for years and he's got a really tight understanding of where his HRV is moment by moment because he's trained himself. I know people that have um, been in cancer treatment that go in and get, get readings on a particular type of cell and over a period of a few weeks they learn to calibrate and they can go in and they go, I'm 85 today. And the, the, the technicians are looking at them like, you can't know that. And they'll go and they'll go, it's, you've, you're actually 85 today. And they're, they're learning and, and using these instruments to calibrate something about their body uh, in, a, in a way that normal sensing doesn't allow. And I think, you know, that's, that's extraordinary. And when you can do that, you can start to manipulate your, your internal representations and internal, internal senses. Yeah, and I think, I, I think too, even like, 
going less um, technical or physiological, like um, writing again, like writing things down and you see it, um, you can start kind of changing your mindset. Um, again, going back to something you said before we hit the record button, um, you know, the, just the, the lens through which you started viewing your job, um, changed, you know, you, you, you saw it as a, as a learning opportunity, as a, as a feedback opportunity. And, uh, I, I think, yeah, I think writing, writing down in a notebook, it allows you to kind of do the same. Um, there's been several times where I've written like angry messages to myself of like, Hey, you know, you got to get your act together. Like, you know, you got to, got to change your mindset and it actually helped me change my mindset. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm really, again, I'm really fascinated, um, about this. And I, I do think that if, you know, you're talking about change, uh, individual change, uh, you know, self, self-knowledge then, uh, then this is this is the exact way to do it. Yeah, and I, I think one of the big advantages of writing something down, uh, particularly when you do it over a long period like like you've been doing, is you can see patterns that don't appear obvious in the short time frames. You can look and see things that are happening over over maybe a decade or years, uh, and I, I think that's perhaps that's where I'd like to go now. And just thinking about. You've done a lot of podcasts now. You've interviewed a lot of really, really cool people, a lot of really interesting leaders. If you look at some of the patterns there, I want to I want to compare and contrast some of the some of the best and some of the worst examples of feedback and feed forward. You, you began by talking about the, the the race to the South Pole. Uh, in a in a military context, what what's an example of some of the best feedback and feed forward? you've encountered across your interviews uh, and what are some of the worst examples that, that you could think of? So best and worst in the military of, of feedback and feed forward. Yeah, that's uh, so I would say, and I, I, you know, it's, it's funny. I think like maybe 10% or less of my guests have actually been military. I'm so interested by people who aren't in the military who are doing something different. Um, but, but one person comes to mind, Chris Hadfield, you know, he's Canada's Neil Armstrong. He's a, he, just an amazing astronaut. And he was like the, I believe he was a, the first Canadian to do a spacewalk. And so one of the things that, that Chris was, was telling me was that, uh, was he, he talked about the importance of simulations. And so, you know, a, every time before they go out, before they actually launch, they do a ton and ton of simulations. And the goal of them isn't necessarily to look good yourself, to be able to say, hey, I'm the best astronaut there is. The goal is to identify problems so that you have everybody there on the ground with you in the pool or whatever the, you know, the simulator is. And then when you're actually in space uh, doing it, like the kinks have been worked out. And I, I always thought that was, uh, that was a great point. And then, and then the other thing too, is that all simulations are wrong. He says that all the time. And so that, and I think that's really important in the military too, for us, because we do do a lot of training, um, but they don't necessarily replicate the realities of war. And so is, is understanding that and understanding where that divergence is between laser tag and actual combat and then not getting sucked into some of the wrong lessons. And so um, I, I think that's a good example of a uh, of feedback and, and feed forward giving feedback. Kim Scott is another one. She, uh, she wrote a book called radical candor, which is like my feedback Bible. And, um, and, and she just talks about the importance of, of giving feedback that, you know, a lot of times we're scared to tell somebody that they're messed up and we, in our minds, we're protecting that person. But in reality, we're protecting ourselves. We're being selfish. And so just t changing that mindset in my own career field of, of giving people honest and direct feedback um, because that's what I owe them as a leader. You know, that, that was something that, that uh, I learned from Kim that, that's really stuck with me. 
And what about just just thinking contemporary, uh, and this can be any domain or anything that's happening right now. What are some examples where we're clearly falling down that that deep hole? We're, we're repeating that, you know, chapter one, chapter two. I fell down the hole. I'm lost. Hey, I've fallen down the hole again. I'm still lost. Can you think of any examples where you go, you know, come on, come on, guys? I mean, I can think of a couple right now. <laughs> but anything stands out for you? I'm not gonna like name specific people, but I, I think that uh, it like like I, it's really interesting. I, I've lately gone back and I've been reading uh, Plutarch's Parallel Lives. Um, I read. I've got. Uh, I don't have the entire uh, the version where it's the uh, the um, Greeks uh, compared to the Romans. Like I, I read the Roman Lives, and now I'm reading uh, Hellenistic Lives. And, uh, and you see the people gravitating uh, towards loud, outspoken demagogues um, and, uh, and leading, uh, you know, city states uh, towards ruin. And uh, it's just interesting now, like, uh, you know, a lot of the people that are outspoken that have large followings, especially on social media, um, are no different uh, than some of the characters that, that Plutarch wrote about. And so I, I just, I think that's really fascinating that, it, you know, as humans, we haven't changed too much, uh, that we still find ourselves gravitating uh, towards those those types of figures. Yeah, yeah. I, I think if you, if you look at some of the, some of the big global conflicts that are happening right now, we tend to lump the the i'm going to call it an iconic leader the figurehead the loud egotist narcissist with with the population and i think that's a massive mistake we talk about a country as if they're unified in their in their approach and their ideals and their and the hubris and the, and the horrible things that they're doing uh when in fact the people uh within those countries that might be at war right now they're completely different to the leadership or the terrorist cells or, or the, you know, the, the representations. I think we need to be really distinct between uh, some of the leaders, some of the people that are, that are driving action uh, and, the, and what the population are enduring. Um, but there's clearly a lack of learning there. You know, we're repeating things, like you say, that have been going on for 2,000 years. Yeah, yeah. And, I, I mean, even... Uh... You know, like you go back and, and read uh, Marcus Aurelius's meditations. Um, you know, he's 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 a, a Roman emperor who's commanding an army on uh, you know that their their northern front, and there's a plague going on, and uh, it, it's just really interesting to read some of some of his thoughts. And I think like one of his entries talks about like people are more concerned with the, uh, the poison in the air than they are the poison between their ears. And so, um, it, it's just, it's, uh, it, it, again, it, it, uh, it just shows you how much we haven't changed. But I think when you take a long view of, of history, um, there's also a little bit of positivity too. Like, um, you know, they were dealing with the same thing 2000 years ago that we're dealing with today. And, uh, and we're still, you know, we're still here. You and I are having this conversation right now. Um, so like things are, I, I'm a very positive, I try to be a positive person. And so like things are going to, going to work out. Yeah. Just reflecting on that, that, that arc of time, you know, 2000 years, uh, Marcus Aurelius, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Stoic philosophers. Um, in fact, I've named, named my children after them. I've got Atticus and an Aurelius uh, for my <laughs> kids, great. right? Yeah. And um, uh, th there's a there's a long-standing um, metaphor about the the emperor's new clothes, and you know this, this person comes out uh, not wearing any clothes, and uh, and there's no one's no one's brave enough to to provide that radical candor that you talk about that you've you've taken as inspiration from. I think you said Kim Scott. I'm going to follow that up uh, next, and and I think that's so key, isn't it that that we need to be able to pull out and identify these patterns of behaviour, particularly in leaders, and you talk about the lo loud, outspoken demagogues. Uh, how do we provide that feedback? How do we 
talk about it amongst ourselves so that we're not drawn in on that. So you've got that past part of the feedback. And then you talked about Chris Hadfield's work, the, you know, as an astronaut on the, on the feed forward. And you said something really important there that I like, and it's about the importance of simulations and that all simulations are wrong. Uh, and in the military, you know, we do a lot of planning, a lot of preparation, but you're not able to replicate realities. Uh, I, I wanted to share something that, that, that happened earlier this week. Um, I was I was coaching uh, uh, an athlete that I've been working with. In fact, he's now a coach, uh, Safwan Khalil, uh, three time Olympian uh, in in Taekwondo, and he's now got a young a young student who's uh, aspiring to go into the Olympics uh, in in Paris, uh, Juliet. And we're, we're talking about her preparation, and we're doing a feed forward activity. And she's got two and a half weeks to go before a peak event. And I said, so tell me about your training. Does your training in, in an immaculate way represent where it needs to be right now? Are you training for two-minute rounds with a one-minute break? And are, you, are all of your scenarios as close as they can be to the reality of what you're going to, to face? And I talk about, in particular, the importance of rest. You've got a two-minute round and you've got a one-minute break. Are you rehearsing the one-minute break? And we went through this in a micro way, every facet of her training to match it to the, to the competition. So it's really shaken up their training to make the scenario testing as realistic as possible. Yeah, I, speaking of that, there's, a, there's an interview I did with uh, Sally Jenkins. She's a, a famous sports journalist in the United States. And one of the stories she tells go, is in line with that. So uh, Coach Tony Dungy of the Indianapolis Colts uh, would wet the ball, uh, would hose it down, uh, the, the football, and, uh, and Peyton Manning and the rest of the team used to make fun of him for it. And, uh, you know, the Indianapolis Colts played in a dome. And, uh, and so, you know, they were like, why is coach doing this? And they would say things like, well, maybe the dome will get a leak one day. And they just laughed at him and thought it was funny. Well, Indianapolis makes their way into the Super Bowl in Miami against the Chicago Bears. And Peyton wakes up one morning, uh, the morning of the Super Bowl, and looks out the window from his hotel room. And it is pouring down rain. And, uh, and they're playing in an open air stadium and, uh, they didn't mess up. They didn't have any turnovers in that game because they had spent their entire season practicing, um, with a wet ball. And so I, I think, uh, I think that's to, to, to your point with, with Juliet, I think that's so important to train the best you can for the conditions that you will encounter. Yeah, I, and I like that as well. And this relates to what you're also talking about with Chris and, and that learning, which is you're trying to, it's not necessarily you're trying to pick the problem that will emerge, but by exposure to lots and lots of problems and lots of adversity, you're prepared for the, for the problem that comes your way that you haven't prepared for because you've prepared for any sort of eventuality. Right. I, I think, um, you know, one of the things that, that um, I, I've kind of figured out over the years, when, especially when it comes to problem solving, is we start, all of us, we start out with a phrase uh, when we encounter something new or novel. And we start out with, it's like, in our heads. And then we just go through our jukebox of past experience, of things we've read. And we just go through the Rolodex very quickly and develop a solution for it. And I think as much as we can to, to fill up our reservoirs with it's like um, the, you know, the different scenarios that, that we'll encounter, I think it, it lowers our stress level when we actually face something new and novel and it doesn't completely throw us off. We may not always get it right. Um, you know, and, th and then that's when we, that's when uh, we don't fail, we get feedback. Um, which is, you know, that the, the quote from that chapter in your book. And then we can actually 
uh, feed for it. So I, I, I think that's, that's so important. I think for me, re- that's why reading has been such an important daily ritual for me is uh, it, it's not only brought awareness to personal stuff that I've, I've encountered, but also in, in my own profession is preparing me for those, um, you know, encounters that, that, that I, I hadn't faced before. Yeah, there's um, there's something here. We've we're going back and forth through the ages. We're, we're we're talking about we've gone from Marcus Aurelius to today, and we're talking about reading and and what that gives us when we can read across domains and through time. And I know that at the moment in your in your blogs, you you're you're talking about uh, the hero's journey and reflecting on that. Now, the hero's journey is a is a pattern in storytelling that's repeated over and over and over in some of the very best novels, uh, and it's a it's a it's a great way to sell books. I mean, if we're if we're honest, you know, you you can there's a formula there that works, but there's also a lot in there about about teaching and learning. And and I just want want to ask you a question because you've been thinking a lot about the hero's the hero's journey recently. If you think about what's the importance of feedback uh, and feed forward in the hero's journey, if we were to put that this concept into the hero's journey, what would it be? Well, let me let me like start off for for I guess back up a little bit for folks that aren't familiar with the hero's journey. Is uh, Professor Joseph Campbell studied myths and religions and. Uh, and, and even fairy tales of, of all around the world. And, uh, and he found this pattern uh, that Dr. Snape's talking about that, uh, that's universal. Um, and he calls, it, he calls it the monomyth. And the book that he actually wrote is called uh, A Hero uh, with a Thousand Faces because it's the same story told a thousand different ways. And the hero's journey, it goes to something like this is a, uh, a hero doesn't realize they're a hero. Um, all of a sudden, a mystery, a mysterious traveler shows up in the village and invites the hero on a quest. The hero at first says, no, I don't want to do this. This is dumb. And either by the universe nudging the hero or on the hero's own, um, you know, own abilities, the hero then embarks on this quest and uh, and then th- at first the hero is going to face what what uh, Campbell identified as these threshold guardians, uh, which actually block the hero before they enter this this special world, and uh, it's a test to make sure the hero is actually ready to embark on the journey. So the hero then moves into the special world, and all these uh, these mentors, allies, and uh, and just outlandish beings just just come into play. And so you think of any movie, think The Matrix. Uh, think Wizard of Oz, um, think uh, think Star Wars, and then even go back to to Gilgamesh, and uh, and and the Odyssey. Some of some of our greatest stories uh, that that we continue to tell, even in some of our our world's religions, um, the the hero's journey is present. And then the hero faces this final ordeal, but the hero has been given gifts and advice along the way from these mentor and allies. The hero faces this ordeal slays the dragon, kills the monster, and gets a gift. The hero then returns back to the ordinary world uh, with this gift uh, that, that he or she brings back um, for, for, their, for their communities. And so, the, uh, so then going back to your question now, the idea of, of feedback and, and feed forward in the hero's journey. I, I believe... I believe that we are all here on earth with, with a purpose. Like I I believe it. And I believe that sometimes our life's purpose is discovering that purpose to figure out what it is we're here to do. What is our gift that we have to give other people to help, help our communities out. And, and I think that sometimes when we, um, you know, when, when we're not on that path, the, uh, the universe gives us signals whether it's being fired from a job, whether it's uh, professional doors closing, uh, whether it's a relationship that goes awry, um, that uh, that tells us that we're not on on the right path, 
And so I think paying attention to that is, is super important. And matter of fact, um, you know, the psychiatrist Carl Jung uh, developed this term called synchronicities when he talks about our inner worlds, our, our inner minds matching up with the, with the outer worlds. And so I, I even look at, like when I look at this development of the hero's journey, which I've been writing about now for uh, like 40 weeks, um, like it, it, it's crazy. Like I, I didn't have anything. I had a page written prior to the start of 2023 and I didn't know how I was going to get from, uh, you know, week one to, to, uh, to the final week of, of 2023 and things just started working out. Like I would discover a book that held the key to something I needed, or I would have a conversation with somebody who would clue me in on something that I needed. And it was being, uh, it was paying attention to being open to that experience that, uh, that has allowed me to continue doing it and, uh, and to continue to produce this series every single week. And so, um, I, I think feedback feed forward, I think it's being open to it. Um, not being closed off, not being, well, Hey, like for me, I signed up to be in the military 20 years ago and that's the path I have to stay on. Um, you know, maybe, maybe there's a different path. I talked to, uh, a, uh, a, a Colonel who's been in for over 25 years and retired and was trying to figure out what he wanted to do. And he started studying the hero's journey and found out he wanted to be a sports coach and, uh, completely different from what a lot of, of, uh, of folks with that experience level do. And so anyways, I, I, I uh, I, I think it's it's such a powerful lens to 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 view life through. Yeah, wow, well, there's a lot there. I think um, I, I like this idea of uh, of a synchronicity. Uh, we talk about you know you talk about the inner and the outer. I often talk about the your our internal state and how we're responding to our external context, uh, and are they matched? And and I talk about that much more than I talk about, hey, do I have confidence? Right. You know, it might be that the external context requires me to have a bit of fear or a bit of anxiety or a bit of flow or it could be all sorts of different states. It just depends on the context, right? Right. And, and I think the most the most important thing that you said, which is you said being open to it, and that's being open to the feedback that you're getting or, or, or the nature of this change. And, and I think there's an important thing there for me, which is about – noticing are we actually noticing what the changes are you know it could be for some people they could they could be a they might entirely miss the opportunity for the hero's journey just because they just plain don't notice they're not paying attention i i, I love that um you know one, one of the things that Prof, uh, professor campbell studied was the grail stories and he actually said that what's interesting about the Grail legends is that knights uh, could ride over the same terrain where the the uh, Grail castle is located and never find it. Um, and so I, I, I think that's so important. And and one of the emails I wrote about synchronicity was uh, it was a year and a half ago. I was wrestling with taking the current job I'm in. And I had pretty much made up my mind that I was not going to take this job. And uh, one day at work, a, uh, a, a friend came up to me. I, I'll just call him JC. Um, and he's Haitian. So it made it even more, uh, it just made it even more powerful. And he, he sat down next to me and he's like, you know, Joe, I've been thinking, um, I think you need to take that job. We hadn't had this conversation at all. He, uh, I don't, I don't know how he knew I was wrestling with it in that moment. Uh, but when he said, I think you need to take it. I think, uh, you know, the next two years can be a laboratory where you learn about yourself and you're able to, to test things. And, uh, I was like, yeah, you're, you're right. And in that moment, I made the decision to, to take the job I'm in now. And, uh, I, I don't know what life would look like if I would have gone a different path. Uh, but but I needed to be open to that. And so I look at in my own hero's journey, I look at, you know, JC being an ally um, who who was there to help me along uh, with, with something that I was wrestling with. Mm. 
Wow, fantastic. Uh, I've got a few things I'm going to draw together in the moment. And, and just before I do that, uh, there's a question I love to ask because it's quite vague uh, and, it's, and, it, and it relates to this conversation where we are right now around the hero's journey and it's about noticing and, and attention. And the question is, uh, if you could direct people's attention to something important in the world, what would it be? Yeah, I think um, it, it's funny that, that you asked that because what, what I've been working on is uh, the next series of the hero's journey, the next couple of weeks. And uh, I, I have a post called uh, that, that's coming out called attention equals life. And uh, our attention is our cognitive currency, our mental money and outside forces are trying to get us to spend every last do dollar want this buy this get outraged comment like follow subscribe reply repost keep scrolling click here swipe left and um and then i i wrote that like we wouldn't give us str our strain any stranger our prized personal possessions and yet we do every single day with our attention um, and this directly impacts our quality of life. And there's a book I read a couple of years ago called Wrapped Attention in the Focus Life by Winifred Gallagher. And she wrote that your life, who you are, what you think, feel and do, what you love is the sum of what you focus on. And I, and I think if we aren't careful that we get distracted, end up focusing on the things that we don't really care about. Um, that are mostly outside of, of, of our control. And so I, I'll give you an example. Like instead of focusing on how I'm feeling in the moment, I will pick up my phone, get on Instagram and see something that makes me mad. And now all of a sudden I am worried about something that I've completely no control over that I'm now mad about. And, uh, and that, that feeling kind of um, stays with me for a little bit. And so I think that uh, if if somebody could, if if people were, if there's one thing that everybody could focus on right now, I would say like, what's going on with me? Um, not like me, but like, what's going on with you? Um, and uh, and kind of like sitting with that for a little bit. Yeah, I love that. Attention equals life. Uh, just looking at looking forward, uh, either career or from the green notebook or personal life, where is your attention for the future? Where are you heading? What's next? Yeah, I think um, I, like right now, I feel called on the hero's journey to uh, to leave the path I'm currently on and try something new. Um, so you know, right, right, like uh, this this series I've been writing about, I'm I'm thirty thousand words into it. And uh, I, I think I got about another ten or fifteen thousand left, and then uh, and then I, I'd like to publish it in a in a book, um, a collection of these uh, these weekly emails that that follow the journey, so other people other people can read it. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know where this is going. Um, I'm just I'm just going to follow it and see what happens. Ah, fantastic. I've really enjoyed our conversation today and it's it's gone back and forth from contemporary thinking where we are right now uh, and across the ages. And I think that's what we get from from reading and journaling. It's a perspective on time and space that's 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 broader than we might be able to hold in conscious attention at any point in time. Yeah, and if if uh if any of your listeners are, you know, they, they still think this is kind of like two pie in the sky or, or it's, it's, it's too abstract. Um, I will tell you that if you get in an argument with your spouse about something that happened a year ago, um, you, if you keep a journal, <laughs> you never have to worry about being wrong or, um, or, or, uh, you find out that you were wrong and you have to go back upstairs and apologize. Um, but you have immediate closure on it. Um, I don't recommend that at all, but, uh, it's a great, <laughs> it's a great, it's a great, great way to, uh, actually pay attention, um, to, to your life. And so I, I really appreciate the time today to have this discussion. Yeah. And I think, um, if I'm going to summarize, I like to summarize in about three points, our whole conversation, the things that have really stood out for me. 
Uh, I, I've got four. Where you where you ended there, which is you know attention equals life. That is our currency. Uh, you know your 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 cognitive currency. Spend it wisely. Uh, I don't think it can get any more profound than that. I think that within there, the, the, as I backtrack, there's this piece about the hero's journey and uh, and that work, you know, particularly the the, the studies of um, Professor Campbell on on the Holy Grail. And you said, you know, it, so many knights would walk across it and just plain not notice. They're there, but but do we pay attention? Do we notice the opportunities? Uh, and I think that's a key. That's a salient point for me. I, I think then we went into we began with some pattern matching, and I think this is key about the the journaling aspect. You know, we might prepare or we might recognise a whole range of scenarios that prepare us for an uncertain future, and it's not that we're going to encounter the same, but that we can say I've seen this pattern before. It's similar or it's like this, and I've got something I can draw on to learn and cope and survive and make sense of what I'm experiencing. And I think that for me is one of the big things about the, the Swiss army knife for thought, you know, the, the benefit of this journal, that we can see things, we can see patterns uh, through time and space and go, actually, this is something underlying here that I can learn from. Uh, and whether that's just as simple as uh, the five chapters in the autobiography of the, the deep hole, you know, Am I, do I keep repeating the pattern of falling into the hole in chapters one and two? Am I stuck in chapter two? Or do I get to chapter five where I can choose a different street entirely? And uh, I think that's where I want to end today. I think, you know, that, that's what I've taken from today is, a, you know, those really top level points. Uh, well, I, I appreciate the, the opportunity to have this discussion. And there's, there's things that you and I have talked about that I've literally been racking my brains um, over the last – couple of days trying to figure out with this hero's journey thing um where i'm going with like where i'm going in the next couple of weeks and uh i think i i think you just unlocked something for me <laughs> so thanks <laughs> fantastic thanks so much um and uh just for uh, just for our listeners uh hop on hop online check out uh from the green notebook uh so many resources in there it's terrific stuff thanks a lot yeah thank you so much we hope you enjoyed this episode of The Salience Podcast. Please leave us a review and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You can also subscribe to the Frontline Mind newsletter by visiting our website at frontlinemind.com. Have you got a topic you would like some more salience on? Send us a message on LinkedIn or email team at frontlinemind.com.